Hello again, welcome back to the day of daily Bible study. We're continuing on with the first letter of Peter. We're in chapter one and we're going to start in verse 10. Um, before we do, let's pray. Uh, loving God, as we listen to the witness of the apostle Peter, uh, Lord, we thank you that you have uh, given us that Lord, it's not just, you know, some people in history have said that Paul invented Christianity, but Lord, we are reminded that this Peter is bearing witness to the same gospel that Paul is bearing witness to. Uh, and Lord, we have a diversity of views that are all telling us about the same Jesus. Uh, Lord, help us to take what Peter has to give to us and let us uh, hold it uh, in tension sometimes, but also to see the greater depth that we also see with Paul and the other New Testament authors. Lord, be with us as we consider Peter's words today, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I I alluded to, um, there's this notion, and I picked this up from T.F. Torrance, and and it was um, this idea of if you were to compare what your left eye sees with what your right eye sees, they are literally different at every single point. And yet the tensions between those two, the disagreements between those two, uh, the difference between what your two eyes see, not only are not, we don't see this being a problem as they're contradictory to each other, but actually put together, they give us a a depth of dimension uh, that we see things more truly as they actually are than we would with either the one or the other. And so I think it's important that we realize that even when Peter uses terms that Paul doesn't or vice versa, or they prov- he provides a slightly different emphasis. It's like the different emphases of the gospel accounts that uh, what I hope in seeing those things and drawing attention to them is not that you would walk away saying, oh, these guys can't agree, um, but an acknowledgement of there is a depth of reality here that is that we need to see from more than one angle. Uh, and I think it's very encouraging. Um, anyway, uh, so we continue on here, starting in verse 10, and we read, As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries. Uh, seeking to know what pers- uh, what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all of your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So um, what's fascinating here is this really is a a remarkable um, assessment on the importance of the Old Testament. And I think that, and to a certain degree, uh, this whole project for three and a half years or more now, uh, could be seen as an example of what's wrong with the church, and that is a, a relentless emphasis on the New Testament. Um, and it's true, I don't intend to do, continue these uh, reflections to try to go through the Old Testament with the same kind of micro-analysis, and a lot of it has to do with the very real differences between what the Old Testament is versus the New Testament. The Old Testament has a lot of uh, narrative, but the narrative is not necessarily, I mean, it's not of Jesus, you know, so you can't necessarily draw a direct comparison with what Jacob does, for example, with what God thinks in a way you can with Jesus. And you're not being written with this kind of close attention to detailed instruction that we get in these letters. So it's really a different, there's a lot of different genres at play. And yet it's incredibly important. And, we, and I, I want to use this opposite. So what, what Peter's saying here is he's saying there are these people um, who were, they were these, these prophets, they prophesied the grace to come, and they were talking about what was to come, what was to expect, and they weren't serving themselves, they're serving us, the people who come to faith in Jesus. We are the beneficiaries of what these Old Testament authors and prophets were up to. And um, he was saying that these are things that, that God is revealing God's very self, the very things that even the angels uh, yearn to look into. We are being given real revelation of God in a way that even the angels don't get to experience. And so he's saying, you know, keep your, prepare your minds for action. Do the work. And I think that what's really important to realize is that in this first generation of Christians, there was no New Testament. You know, the New Testament is actively being written. You have people who are proclaiming Jesus and who are doing all these things. But when people say, you know, the scripture, the scripture, yeah, as it is written, all the rest, they're not talking about the New Testament. They're talking about the Old Testament. And that is extremely important for us to grasp today that, you know, when Paul is going around saying, I'm going to prove these things from scripture, he's not saying I'm going to prove them from the letters that I have already written. And he's not saying I'm going to prove it from the gospels that have not yet been written. He's saying, I'm going to prove it from the Old Testament. And there is this sense and this expectation that if you really want to understand what Jesus is up to, you've got to be immersed in this Old Testament witness. And I appreciate, like I said, you know, I might be contributing to the problem by talking about the New Testament, 
but I think there is there is no shortcut in the end that there's a certain assumption um, that that by that Christians will know what God has done in the Old Testament, and um, and Peter's saying you know prepare your minds for action, be sober, put the work into it, pay attention. You know there was ignorance in the past, but now you've learned better, and because you've learned better, now you need to really engage in this development, engage in the spiritual formation, engage in this discipline of your mind. Um, and by which he means read the scripture, and which we would mean read the Old Testament. Um, so here's Peter kind of saying he's, he's done this massively um, grand scope in that first passage about um, all of these key theological ideas. And he's then said, you know, all of this, all of this, all of this is rooted in the Old Testament witness. All of it is. Um, and it's important to realize that those early Christians saw themselves on the one hand as proclaiming something new that God has done in the fact that God had never become human being a human being before and lived among us. And yet it's important that we grasp that they also said God's really not doing something fundamentally new. God's simply doing what God has always promised that God would do. And if we have eyes to see and ears to hear, we can understand that. Um, and we can learn and we can, you know, gather all the more clearly what God was up to. So, um, I think it's really important that we, that we grasp here that, um, that we need to be holy in our behavior, that our commitment to the ways of God in our lives and our actions are also part of how we come to know things. Um, Athanasius of Alexandria, one of the most important theologians in history, um, towards the end of his work on the incarnation, um, said basically, if you want to understand what the apostles and prophets wrote, you have to live lives that are consistent with their message. You know, so if you want to understand God, um, at some point you have to live your life in light of what God actually commands. And if you find the scripture hard to understand, it is possible that it's because um, your know, obedience is not fully complete. And I'm not saying it's complete for any of us, but um, it's not simply, you know, knowledge of God, according to the Bible, is never simply merely a mental activity. It's a very Greek notion. Um, knowledge is going to be very embodied. That is body and soul and life and lived experience and, you know, embedding the will of God into our hearts and lives so that we live it. We live the truth, not just simply think the truth. Um, and I think that's a very important theme that we see here in this passage. Well, that's all for today. Come back tomorrow. We'll have more of the first letter of Peter. Have a good day.